to, today uh, to join us um, for our talk. Um, I'm Dr. Ronald C. I'm the chair of psychology, and uh, thank you, my fans up there. Yeah, um, I, I pay them an extra credit for doing that. Um, uh, thank you for coming out. Uh, it's really a pleasure to have everyone here, and it's really an honor and pleasure to have Dr. Stephen Grant joining us uh, this afternoon. Um, Dr. Grant received his bachelor's degree at McDaniel College in Maryland, and then went on to do his PhD at the University of Georgia. Uh, go, go Bulldogs, huh? Uh, yeah, and uh, uh, got his uh, PhD there in biopsychology, which is a, a name back in our day they used to call behavioral neuroscience. That's the, the new name, but the same thing, biopsychology. He went on and did his postdoctoral fellowship at the psychiatry department at Yale uh, School of Medicine in Connecticut, where he focused on neurophysiological and behavioral studies of the brain noradrenergic system. Um, after that, he uh, went on to be a professor, so he did his stint in academia as a professor in the psychology department at the University of Delaware. But then uh, the National Institute of Health came calling, and uh, he moved over to the intramural research program at the National Institute on Drug Abuse, which is the nation's preeminent funder of, of uh, research in substance use disorders. So he was a staff scientist there, and he conducted studies on drug craving and decision making in humans, where he combined cognitive neuroscience and new techniques in brain imaging to study um, very uh, intricate circuit patterns that happen under conditions of craving for drugs like cocaine. In fact, I have very clear memory of a very seminal paper that Steve published on craving and cocaine dependent subjects that uh, everyone in the world was citing when it came out, and uh, still to this day, very, very important work. Um, he went on to join NIDA, uh, stayed at NIDA, and became a program officer, so kind of more at the administrative uh, 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 kind of regulatory level, where he developed a nationwide funding program on the cognitive neuroscience of substance abuse and went on to be the chief of their clinical neuroscience branch. Um, after all that time at NIDA, he decided he needed to move to somewhere nicer than Washington, <laughs> D.C., so he came to Santa Barbara. Um, and he joined what's called the Hefter Research Institute in 2021, uh, where he now pursues his longstanding interest in psychedelic drug research. Um, it's been a, Steve and I have kind of crossed paths for many years, and uh, I think it goes way back to ACNP meetings in, in places like uh, uh, Puerto Rico and, and Hawaii. Psychiatrists know where to go for the best meetings. Um, and, and we were on panels together, and I just, one thing I always appreciate about Dr. Grant, and it just, he provided some of the most insightful comments and questions in every panel that we had when it came to substance use disorders. And it was just a, a real joy to get to, to get to know him in that professional way and uh, always just uh, stimulating in his, in his thoughts and his ideas. And so really pleased he could join us, that he's uh, local now with us here in Santa Barbara. And so uh, he will be talking to us today on advances in psychedelic research with a particular interest in how these drugs, which have been around quite a while, are being reinvestigated and redirected for the treatment of psychological disorders. So please welcome Dr. Steve Grant. Thank you, Ron, for those kind words. It is an honor and a privilege to be here. The campus is stunning on a beautiful fall afternoon. Couldn't ask for anything better than to sit in a lecture hall and listen to somebody else talk. So, <clears throat> To get going, um, there has been, ooh, what, what happened to that? What happened to my chart? There it is. Okay. Um, there, as you well know, as many of you are well aware, there's been a massive increase in the interest in psychedelic drugs over the past two decades, as indicated by the sharp rise in scientific publications. But scientific research into psychedelic drugs goes back into the late 1940s. The first wave of research peaked in the early 1970s, you can see here, then fell off, markedly declined for the next 30 years, and then picked up at the turn of the century and has been increasing exponentially ever since. So what happened? This is kind of an unusual trajectory for research, that it peaked and then declined and now has resurged. First, it's important to recognize that psychedelic drugs have existed for thousands of years. And use of psilocybin mushrooms, as illustrated in this cave painting in Tunisia, um, what's called the Bee Man, um, 
with, who is outlined in mushroom-like figures, um, art from Mesoamerica, uh, peyote cactus by indigenous people of the Southwest in Mexico. That's a Huichol uh, yarn painting of a peyote cactus bud. Um, ayahuasca, which is a, uh, a vine, two vines that are combined together in a brew um, in South America. Uh, these, these drugs have been used by ancient and indigenous cultures that date back into prehistory. But let's jump ahead to the early 20th century. In 1896, Arthur Hefter, the Hefter Research Foundation was named after him, isolated mescaline from peyote cactus. Then in 1943, Albert Hoffman famously synthesized LSD, although he did, um, he again famously did not take it until 1946. And then in 1956, Albert Hoffman isolated psilocybin from mushrooms. Research into psychedelic drugs accelerated after World War II. The public became aware of these drugs through publications like Aldous Huxley's The Doors of Perceptions about his mescaline use. And the 1957 article in Life magazine describing Gordon Wasson's psilocybin use in met mushroom under the guidance of the indigenous med medicine woman Maria Sabina. In this, the, but in, from the research perspective, LSD was the drug of choice for research in the 1950s into the mid-1960s because Sandoz, the owners of LSD, Albert Hoffman was a chemist for Sandoz, widely distributed LSD to researchers and clinicians. Research focused on the understanding the pharmacological mechanism of action of these drugs, their potential therapeutic effects as an adjunct to psychotherapy, and also their potential as a model of psychotic disorders such as psychosis. Although much of the research was funded by the National Institute of Mental Health, studies were also funded directly or indirectly through, during this period by the, through the CIA's infamous mind control program named MKUltra. Those of you who might be interested in the history of MKUltra, I would recommend the book Poisoner in Chief, which came out about two years ago. But by, 1960, by the early 1960s, multiple factors converged that led to the decline in psychedelic drug use, uh, drug research. Culturally, there was increasing use of these drugs outside of the research environment for recreational use. I think everyone is familiar with the counterculture and hippies and what happened there. In 1963, Harvard fired Timothy Leary, Richard Alpa, and their associates um, based on their drug studies. And Timothy Leary went on to be considered, at least by the President Nixon of the time, as the most dangerous man in America for his advocacy of LSD. However, there was never, a, contrary to pop, uh, most, what most people think, there was never an outright ban on research into psychedelic drugs. Rather, there were changes in regulations and laws that made psychedelic research increasingly difficult. In 1962, the FDA was tasked to evaluate efficacy when um, deciding whether a drug could be put on the market. This stands in contrast to what they had been doing up until then, where the focus was primarily on safety. Up until that time, the FDA approved drugs based on case reports and anecdotal clinical evidence. After 1962, the FDA started requiring what was termed adequate and well-controlled investigations which led to the prominence of what we now consider to be the gold standard, the randomized controlled design for clinical studies, where people are randomly assigned to a treatment condition, 
and there is a comparison condition, usually a placebo or a comparison drug to um, determine efficacy. As we will see, randomized controlled trials, however, pose difficulties for psychedelic research. They're, it's really trying to fit a round peg into a square hole. And because of that, in 1966, Sandoz decided not to pursue a new drug application. They decided not to pursue drug approval with the FDA, mainly because the studies and data they had collected up until that time, through from the 50s into the early 60s, did not conform to this new regulatory standard and of adequate and well-controlled trials. And even after two decades of research, there was no clear medical indication. It wasn't quite clear what exactly these drugs would be best used for. And we will come back to that when I talk about the current, trial, the current studies. In 1970, as many of you know, Congress passed the Controlled Substance Act. Psychedelic drugs were placed into Schedule I, the most restrictive category greatly raising the barriers to research. Then in 1974, NIMH put out a notice that they would no longer fund psychedelic drug research, partly in reaction to public disclosure of the abuses within the CIA MK Ultra program, but also, again, because of lack of progress after decades of substantial research. While some human studies continued into the late 1970s, clinical research largely ceased. However, basic research focusing on the pharmacological mechanism of action of these drugs continued to a limited degree. Skip ahead to about a decade later, a decade and a half later, two, pro two private nonprofit foundations were organizations were founded to fund psychedelic research. In 1986, the Multidisciplinary Association for Psychedelic Studies, MAPS, was founded to promote research on the therapeutic uses of MDMA. And I'm not going to be talking very much about MDMA in, in this um, lecture. That's kind of a topic in and of itself. But that being said, the clinical trials for MDMA in the treatment of post-traumatic stress disorder have been very striking. And the drug development for MDMA is now um, getting to the point where it is anticipated that MAPS will be submitting uh, a new drug application for approval to the FDA sometime late this year, maybe early next year. In 1993, the Hefter Research Institute was founded to promote research in the classic psychedelic drugs, and that's what I'm going to be focusing on later in the lecture. In 1990, Rick Strassman obtains a IND to do dimethyltryptamine studies, a short-acting uh, psychedelic drug, and that kind of opened up the prospect that it was possible to conduct studies of these drugs again in humans. And then in 2000, Roland Griffith, Bill Richards, and associates started a series of psychedelic studies at the Behavioral Pharmacology Research Unit at Johns Hopkins School of Medicine. Their efforts led to several landmark studies of psilocybin, including a 2006 study in healthy participants that established safety for their procedures and protocol, a 2016 study showing efficacy for depression and anxiety in life-threatening cancer patients, and in 2020, a study on major depression. In 2018, Michael Pollan published a popular book, How to Change Your Mind, which brought this new re research into public attention and really spurred the growth of interest in this field. Now, there are at least 20 academic centers focusing on psychedelic drugs, and there are multiple companies that are developing psychedelic drugs for therapeutic use. Some of these uh, companies are USONA, which is located in San Diego, Compass, and Delix, which is uh, located up in, Herb, um, up in um, Davis. Now, research in psychedelic drugs is not without its problems and difficulties. 
And the first problem is what do we call these compounds? They've gone under many names. These drugs have had a series of different names, none of which are entirely accurate or adequate. One of the first uh, terms that was used was psychotomimetic, meaning that it was mimicking psychosis. It, it was thought to be a way of chemically inducing a psychotic state. That turned out to be not quite accurate uh, because the it, of differences between psychotic states such as schizophrenia and the drug, the psychedelic drug experience. Another term, a second term, was hallucinogen because of the striking visual and auditory and other sensory distortions that these drugs produce. However, this is not an adequate term either because they're not true hallucinations in the sense that people know and report that they know that the, these are drug-induced um, alterations in their perceptions and they're not mistaken for reality. The third term, and the term that I've been using throughout, is psychedelic, which was a neologian, neologism coined by Humphrey Osman and Aldous Huxley, meaning mind manifesting, as they search for a different way of um, describing these drugs. And then a more recent term is entheogen, meaning God producing, or God generating, or spiritual producing that reflects the spiritual components of these drug, this is drug experience. And I'll defer talking about those aspects until the end of the lecture. What makes these drugs so interesting and fascinating to both the public and to researchers is the unusual subjective effects they produce. So these drugs are primarily experiential rather than behavioral. It is not um, often easy to discern whether somebody has taken one of these drugs or not, as opposed to a psychostimulant or an opioid or a benzodiazepine that produce sedation or excitation or other clear behavioral effects. These effects include profound visual and auditory sensory alterations, including marked synesthesia, where people see sounds and hear pictures. There is vivid imagery with either eyes open or eyes closed. Psychologically, perceptions have increased meaning or significance. There can be profound psychological insights, emotional ability, impaired control not only of movement but cognition as well. People are, feel that they're not able to control their thoughts and feelings. There's also what is called self-dissolution, ego dissolution, or loss of identity. People don't feel they lose the sense, I'm not Steve anymore, I am something else, or I am beyond that personal identity. There is also um, disembodiment or dissociation, although that's not, um, that such out of body experiences are uh, not as profound as with other drug classes. Spiritual experiences are common, as well as experiences of unity where everything seems connected, accompanied by, often by a state of profound bliss. Much of the experience is considered often to be ineffable, hard to put into words, that people and people are therefore limited in what they are able to express their experiences been. In addition, these drugs are marked by a heavy modulation by set and setting. Set being the expectations that the individual brings to taking a drug. Do they expect to have a good time? Do they expect to have a bad time? Do they expect to have a uh, profound insights? Are they doing this for recreation? And setting, what is present in the environment. The effects of the drug can be different depending on whether you're in a museum, whether you're in a clinical laboratory situation, whether you're out in the woods. And because of this modulation by set and setting, 
and the difficulties in controlling or having a clear set and un, uh, unpredictable aspects in the environment, the effects of these drugs can be variable and can be somewhat unpredictable. So you might go, in there, go into a drug experience um, with a very clear set of doing some psychological work or this is a therapeutic session and you end up having a spiritual experience. So that's what makes these drugs difficult is the range of um, effects that they have and the unpredictability. So how do these drugs work? These drugs work, um, the, the decades in between the lapse in clinical research, as well as the early phase of research in the 1950s and 60s, led us to have a very clear understanding of the target of action of these drugs. All of these drugs are chemically similar to the neurotransmitter serotonin, which you see up here at the top. And you can see several exemplar uh, drugs, psilocybin, dimethyltryptamine, LSD, um, that have a chemical similarity, a backbone that is similar to, these, um, to the serotonin chemical. Serotonin is found widely within the body. Um, it, is, it was first isolated in the periphery it controls smooth muscle, so there's a lot of it in the blood system, sero, blood, tonin, tonic um, activity, and particularly in the gut. And so there's something called the enteric nervous system that, is, that controls um, intestinal and gut motility, and that is heavily modulated by serotonin. And some of the earliest research on the mechanism of action of LSD was done using assays using gut tissue. And that's where the connection with serotonin was discovered. Serotonin in the brain is a, one of the mod, uh, widespread modulatory systems. Serotonin-containing neurons are located deep in the brain stem but they project throughout the entire brain and particularly across the entire cerebral cortex. It turns out that there are probably 20, 25, depending on how you classify them, different types or subtypes of serotonin receptors. That is the molecule on cell membranes that recognize serotonin and then engage in signal transduction to um, produce the effects of uh, serotonin on the cells. And over decades of research, it's been established that the major effects of serotonin, of, of um, psychedelic drugs, are mediated through the 5-HT, the serotonin, that's 5-hydroxytryptamine, that's the formal chemical name for serotonin. The 5-H2A subtype of receptor and where it acts as a partial agonist, meaning that it um, has a certain limit uh, of action on these receptors in terms of stimulating the receptors. Um, and there's a whole complicated molecular biology story around that. The 5-HT2A receptor was recently crystallized and its structure is well delineated now, and we know now how psychedelic drugs interact with that receptor. Other drugs are often considered to be psychedelic drugs, such as MDMA and ketamine but they work differently than the classic psychedelics. And given the limitations of time, I'm not gonna talk about MDMA or ketamine. They are deserving of a whole lecture in and of themselves. So what has happened to spur the research now? Well, the indications, part, it's partly because the federal government has been more receptive to the research. 
A major development was um, the granting of an IND to Rick Strassman in the 1990s that showed that the FDA, FDA was willing to entertain proposals to study these drugs and broke the idea that there was an absolute ban on research on these drugs. Um, and recently, the FDA published a guidance on psychedelic drugs outlining considerations for clinical investigations, that is, what the FDA considers to be best practices in conducting clinical trials with psychedelic drugs. NIMH, which I noted, um, had issued a notice that they would no longer fund psychedelic drug research in the, 19, in, um, the early 1970s, recently